This video is entitled Project Selection and Validation and goes along with Chapter 1, Initiating, used in our class Project Management for Technology. I'm Dr. James M. Renault from Shawnee State University, and I'll be taking you through this presentation. In this video, we'll be discussing motivating reasons to do a project. We'll be discussing the justifications for starting a project. And we'll also be quantifying or using metrics to justify why we're going to do a project or to measure which project we want to do. What is the business or individual motive that's causing us to want to start a new project? Is it a market force reason? Maybe your competitor has got something they're working on or just released. Is it strategic? Is it something that you need for your business's future? Is it uh, just something you need? Is it a, business, a daily business need or a current business need and not a strategic future business need? Is it something you've got a customer that wants? Do you have a, a customer that needs something? Um, it's a good reason to do a job. Is it for a technological reason? You know, technology is always changing. You've got to kind of get on top of that wave and ride it. There are always updates, new technologies, new ideas, new ways of doing things, new threats if you're doing security and such. Laws. Laws are always changing, and legal motivations are an important reason. If you're not compliant with all of the rules and laws that apply to your business, uh, privacy, customer information, credit card information, and lots of other things, then you can run afoul, and, and it can really hurt your business significantly. So law changes are a great reason to uh, start a project. Environmental reasons are a, a good reason or an often cited reason why we're going to start a new project. Remember, we do only have one home, this, this little ball of dirt that we're on, and um, at least for now, until we, we can leave this little ball of dirt. And then there are our social reasons. You know, sometimes doing a project is just the right thing to do. Building a park doing something of that sort. I don't know. There are lots of reasons, but this is a, a, a partial list. Every project has its motivations, though, and as a person working on a project, as a project manager, or as, as just a, a stakeholder in a project, understanding the motivations and why is very important for you to, to, to think about as you start working on a project. So now that we've identified what motivates us to do the project, we need to come up with justifications as to whether the project makes sense to do. You know, just because you want to do the project doesn't necessarily mean you should do it. What are the benefits to the organization? What are the real benefits to the organization? Does it align with our strategic plan? For instance, if our strategic plan is to buy a new piece of software in the next two to three years, and replace all of our existing software, does it make sense to do that project to update the software? I don't know. It might, it might not. What are the alternatives? Are there multiple ways that we could we can solve this need? Do we build a new building or do we buy a new building? It, it kind of depends. What are the alternatives? Um, why are our experts recommending this project? Why are our employees and our stakeholders really excited about this project and why? And should we do a feasibility study? For lots of projects, I think the answer should be yes. We should spend time asking the question, is it doable? Is the project really doable? And if it is doable, will it succeed? Those are some questions you need to ask yourself as you're starting to come up with project justifications. Some of the things that we'll do as business people to justify a project are to create metrics. Metrics are numbers or, or formulas or algorithms that we use to measure whether, whether to do something or not. And so one of the uh, couple of the metrics I want to discuss on this slide are a cost-benefit analysis. So sitting down and and doing a, a cost and a benefit and, and making a decision as to whether that really makes sense. A scorecard or model 
where you list priorities and you give them a score on a scale of 1 to 10 or 1 to 5 and you then add up the scores and you can kind of make a decision as to which of the two ways or which alternatives are better or worse um, is another way to to come up with metrics and to quantify your justifications, not just use qualifications, but a quantification. A third and an important one you as a, as a business student and a project manager should understand is the idea of a project payback period. For instance, well, a project payback period is the cash flow period to cover the estimated costs. So here's an example. Let's say, for instance, this project costs a million dollars to do. Um, we're going to have cash flows coming in over the next five years as you see in this table, of $100,000 the first year because of the project, $200,000 the second year, $300,000 the third year, and we expect $600,000 the fourth year and, and a half a million dollars in the fifth year because of this project. Well, it kind of makes sense that we would want to do this project. That's a lot of money coming back in for a million dollar expense. But the question is, how quickly do we pay back that million dollars? And the answer is 3.67 or three and two thirds years. And you can see that here we get $100,000. So at the end of year two, we've received $300,000. At the end of year three, we've received $600,000 of our million dollar investment. And we need $300,000 more. $400,000 more to, to, uh, to pay back our, our period, to pay back our original million dollar investment. So that's two thirds of year four. So you can see that would be 3.67 years for the original million dollar investment to be paid back using a payback period. Another metric that business often uses and you should always consider is the discounted cash flow. So how, let's, let's define present value and future value, even though you should be aware of, of what they mean. Stop and think about it. Money in the future. You need $1,000 in two years is worth less than that today. If you put a certain amount of money in an investment for two years to get $1,000, you don't need $1,000 today. Have $1,000 in two years if you invest the money. We think of that as, as a discount. So if you need a million dollars in 10 years, what's the discounted value today? Assuming that you can put it into an investment and earn some money on that original investment. The formula above is how we calculate the present value, the discounted value of the future value. And the future value is, or the present value is, future value divided by 1 plus the interest rate to the nth power, where n is the number of periods and i is the interest rate per period. Let's keep this simple and use i as an interest rate in years and n is the number of years. Here is an example of we need in year zero, which is today, right now, year zero, we need $100,000 to do this project. We need $150,000 in a year. We need $200,000 in two years from today. And we need $250,000 in three years from today. So that would be a total of $700,000 that we need in cash flows to perform this project. Now, I'm using an interest rate of, of 8%. You can see there on the top of the table. And I calculate the discount. And the discount is this uh, bottom here of, of the fraction 1 plus i to the nth. So 0 0.1 plus 0 0.08 to the nth power. Well, anything to the zeroth power is 1. So the discount is 1. At the end of year 1, 1 1.08 to the first power is 1.08. You can see that 1.08 then to the second power at the end of year two is 1.16. And 1.08 to the third, to the third power, is 1.2597. We then uh, take the cash flow, divide it by the discount to come up with the discounted cash flow. 
and you can see that uh, the money we need today is worth, well, what it's worth today. So there's no discount on money today. But the $150,000 we need in one year will only cost us $139,000 today. If we put $139,000 into an 8% investment, we'll have one hundred and fifty dollars at the end of one year. Likewise, also, you can see that if we put $171,400 into an investment today at 8% in two years, it'll be worth $200,000. And if we put $198,000 in change in an investment at 8%, it'll be worth $250,000, growing over fifty dollars in a three-year period. We add up those discounted cash flows and say that, well, hmm, this project is going to cost us $700,000, but if we have $608,815 today in an investment at 8%, we'll have the cash flows to be able to pay $700,000 for the project. This is really helpful when you're comparing two different projects. Maybe you have a project that costs $700,000, but it's $700,000 today. Pay it all up front. Or you've got this one where you can pay it over a period of four payments starting today. Well, which one's going to be cheaper? Well, this one's going to be cheaper by almost $100,000. Maybe you've got two projects that cost completely different kind of numbers on different payment schedules. This allows you to get them back to present dollars or discounted dollars, dollars today. And you can make a better analysis of, of uh, figuring out which one makes more economic sense to you. Also remember, the higher the interest rate, the lower the investment today to come up with larger money in the future. Two more ways that we quantify our justifications are to one, use the net present value. And net present value is a very simple formula of benefit, the present value of the benefit minus the present value of the cost, net present value. If uh, we have a, uh, we can use this also to compare two projects that are similar or two projects that will do the same thing. We can take the projected benefits of the two projects minus the projected costs, present value of the benefit and present value of the cost, come up with the net present value. How much is this really going to be worth to the company? If the net present value is negative, then it's going to cost more than the benefit. If the net present value is positive, then the benefit outweighs the cost. We hope everything we do has a net present value in the positive. Um, a larger positive value is better than a smaller positive value. The uh, next metric that I want to, to introduce is something called the Internal Rate of Return, or IRR. The Internal Rate of Return uses the same present value formula that we used, uh, that we saw on the previous slide. But what it's looking for is to where we know the costs. We know the um, total expense. Well, we know the total expense, which is C0, the total cost. And we know the cash flows coming in in each year above. But we don't know what the interest rate would be. And what we do is we set the sum of the cash flows in discounted equal the cost. That cost could also be a discounted um, uh, cost, or it could be a, a, a flat amount cost. In the example we're going to use, we're just going to use a flat amount, but you could do it as a discounted cost. And uh, um, we calculate this. So it's it's a it's a difficult mathematical thing to do. It's possible. Um, you'll find calculators that will help you do this. And the bigger the internal rate of return calculated, the bigger the interest rate calculated here, the better it is for you and the business. Here are some of the references I use to, to, to find these formulas and to talk more about these uh, metrics. Uh, to calculate payback period, you can see here at accountingcoach.com. And uh, for discounted cash flow, present value, and internal rate of return, I went to Investopedia and looked at, at that website to help generate this presentation.
This presentation is copyright 2019 by James M. Renault, Ph.D. Um, you can contact me at jrenault at shawnee.edu if you have any questions. This work is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution, non-commercial, share-alike, 4.0, international license. And I would like to say, as I always do at the end of these, thank you for watching.